Hi, Ilan. Hi. Nice to, to meet you again, Frank. Uh, same. Um, I, um, I wanted to talk to you uh, today because it's been pretty much um, exactly a week since Hamas and, and other factions of, of uh, Palestinian resistance launched what's, uh, in my lifetime anyway, is an unprecedented attack on, on Israel. Um, since then, I mean, this operation seems to have shocked everyone. I mean, anyone I know, Palestinian, Israelis, uh, diplomats, you know, researchers, activists, everyone seemed to be in shock at the, at the scale and the, and the planning of, of this operation. Um, so I wanted to ask you, as, like, were you shocked as well? But, but also, since the attack happened, um, hysteria has taken over. And in these moments, at least for this one, it seems like the people that are trying to give context to be rational are seen as the monsters and the people that are highly emotional and hysterical seem to be the good guy. Um, you've written also a piece for the Palestine Chronicle talking about moral compass. So yeah, it's like two questions in one, like how surprised, shocked were you by this operation? And can you talk to us about the critical need in these times in particular for moral compass? Yeah, yes. Uh, of course, I was surprised like every by which the Hamas was able to carry out its operation. Uh, I was not surprised by the fact that the Hamas has not given up the, the resistance. And uh, I never bought into the theory that uh, the Hamas has stopped uh, its uh, uh, resistance fighting. Uh, but of course, I, I, I could, like anyone else, I, I could not imagine such a large scale uh, uh, attack, uh, nor would did I imagine that the Israeli army would uh, rumble so easily? Uh, after all, the Hamas has taken over 11 military bases uh, before going to the, the settlements themselves, which I think was a mistake, but we can talk about it later. But I think the military achievement is incredible uh, and unimaginable in many ways, given the balance uh, of power. So in that respect, I was surprised. Uh, like many others, I was not surprised by the fact that Palestinians who uh, who are fighting against Israeli colonization, occupation, and ethnic cleansing would do all they can to stop it. Uh, and uh, liberation struggles are not always done through uh, peaceful means. Uh, armed struggle is an important part of a liberation struggle, and, and therefore, uh, again, I was surprised by the timing, by the scale, by the success, but not by the fact that uh, Palestinians have not stopped resisting. In, in fact, uh, I, I still think that we might still, in, uh, you know, witness a third uprising also in the West Bank and, and not just uh, in Gaza. People would not reconcile for living for so many years under uh, occupation and especially not under siege. Uh, like the one that was imposed on Gaza. Now, to your second question, I think you're absolutely right. I, I think that it's more than just emotion. It's it's a, a, one particular emotion that seems to be licensed uh, by the West and especially the Western political elites when it comes to the event of Saturday, and that is revenge. Revenge is a strategy. Uh, I don't recall in history when the international community uh, instead of showing solidarity, which is understandable, with civilian uh, uh, victims of, of any conflict, has shown uh, solidarity with this base idea of revenge. Uh, revenge that is translated into a genocide, into collective uh, punishment. It's quite surprising to see uh, how, how this is unfolding. The case may be, and I'm not sure, 
that uh, those who decided to don uh, the Parliament House in, in London with the Israeli flag or the Eiffel Tower with the Israeli flag were thinking about the Ukraine and they were thinking, OK, we are showing solidarity with the many Israeli civilians who were killed at the surprise attack. I can, I can understand it, although one should ask where was this solidarity with the thousands of Palestinian victims that, that were killed. But I, maybe they don't understand how this message is being understood in Israel. In Israel, uh, this message is understood. Now you have a free hand to uh, inflict genocidal policies on the ground. And I think that that is where the moral compass, not just of you, your moral compass or my moral compass, but especially the moral compass, if, any, if it all exists among political elites in the West, should uh, come into being. Uh, uh, you should know that you you carry responsibility for what goes on on the ground, not just the Israelis, because the Israelis say to themselves, "Oh, we can we can do what we want now. Uh, we have a free free hand." It reminds me in the way that the Israeli commanders were thinking about the ethnic cleansing of Palestine in 1948. They were convinced that because of the Holocaust, and it, un unfortunately, I think they were right. They were convinced that because of the Holocaust, the international community would allow them to do what they want uh, in Palestine in 1948. And I, I see a similar uh, situation now, of course. And, and the Israelis contribute to it by comparing uh, what happened on Saturday to the Holocaust, which, of course, is a terrible abuse of the Holocaust memory. Uh, but, but that's kind of recreating these ideas that... Uh, Jews who are victims of either Germans or Palestinians, uh, the international community allows them to commit any crime they want without any uh, rebuke. Uh, the moral compass for people like us is, of course, that we 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 know why we support the Palestinians. We'll continue to support the solidarity, the, the liberation movement. That doesn't mean that we cannot voice here and there uh, questions about certain logics behind things, but we also have to understand that we are not living in Gaza. We were not uh, sieged and ghettoized for so many years. Uh, so we, we also have to be careful uh, when we have this more constructive uh, conversation with our Palestinian friends. Thanks, Ilan. Um, how, how worried are you about what's going to happen in the next few days? in Gaza, we know historically that to do or to commit genocide, what comes before is propaganda and tropes, right? We have heard in the last week many stories that, as far as I know, only a few or a tiny few have been verified. And, and again, I think it's in these exact moments that we need to be very precise on the truth and on facts. The stories, the story about Hamas uh, beheading 40 babies that's been repeated all over and has been proven false. Um, the fact that Palestinians are animals and will be treated as such. All of these words and, and being repeated over and over again are preparing not only the nation of Israel, but the world for the massacre that Israel is about to commit. And also, I was reading this morning that the U.S. has now sent a second U.S. carriers to, to you know, Israel to, to prevent escalation. So for me, what it means is there's like this small enclave that's going to be genocided, and we're going to be all around it for people not to see it. So they're highly complicit. It's more than th sending $3 billion per year of mostly military aid. It's now being actively military complicit in what it's about to take place. How worried are you about the next, whatever, few hours, few 48 hours, you know? Yeah, I'm, I'm worried more than for the next 48 hours. I, I, I think uh, the Israelis, it's very clear from what you hear from Israel, that they will not go in with all the force in one go. Uh, what they're going to do is strip by strip. Uh, it will be a very slow operation, not a very uh, quick operation. 
um, and they will uh, occupy slice by slice, I think, uh, the Gaza Strip before they get into the heart of the city. Uh, and I'm very so I'm very worried not just for the next 48 hours, but for the next week or two weeks or maybe even three weeks in, in which um, the civilian space of Gaza would be the, the killing fields of the Israeli uh, army. Uh, so I'm, I'm terribly worried about uh, the genocidal uh, intention, as and rightly you are, you, you're right, that these are manifested by the discourse that the Israelis are using. In fact, if you listen to the Israeli radio and television, uh, and politicians and, and commentators, some of them usually more logical than others, who keep saying that, that uh, these people are worse than the Nazis. I mean, that, that's the main message that they are conveying. And that, of course, gives license to do whatever y you want uh, to do. So, so yes, this is highly, highly uh, uh, wor worrying. And uh, if you add to this the uh, two facts, one, that the whole myth of uh, safe routes out of Gaza uh, was already uh, uh, shown to be uh, untrue uh, two days ago when the Israeli bombed uh, Salah Adin Road, which was supposed to be a safe route and killed a lot of civilians there, including uh, children and women, and women. So there are no safe routes. Uh, secondly, uh, the situation of the water and energy and the hospitals. Uh, would add to uh, uh, the disastrous reality already on the ground. And finally, one can add the fact that it's quite possible that the Egyptians uh, would only allow several humanitarian cases to go through. So so people would really be stuck in that uh, uh, enclave, as, as you call it. And yes, I do think you're right. I, I think exactly because the Israeli operation, and we know it from the past, the Israeli operation would be incremental. It would be stage by stage. I don't expect the one day of genocide and that's it. It would be far more sophisticated in that respect and would mesmerize the world in such a way that they would say, okay, yes, you know, unfortunately things happened yesterday, but uh, this is not the real nature of the operation. And unfortunately with such cases in history, you understand the cumulative impact of, of genocidal policies, especially the Israeli kind of genocidal policies. We know it from the history of Palestine. You understand at the end of the operation, not during uh, the, the, the operation. In fact, the Israelis talk about the next week or two or three even weeks uh, as the repeat of the 48th war. And what that means, if you remember the history of the 48th war, there was not one operation. They had code names for about 25 operations during 1948, all of them were operations of ethnic cleansing. And that's why it was very difficult to blame the Israeli for doing an ethnic cleansing on a total scale because it was kind of divided. So I'm very, I'm very fearful both for the real human consequences and the way the world would react because of the nature that it would be it would be done. Of course, you can always hope because this, and with this I would end this answer, the civil society, I think, including in the global north and in the west, I don't think are being fooled by it. I don't think the civil society has lost its moral compass. I think a lot of people uh, uh, around uh, the world, including in the United States, uh, understand uh, the more complex reality and have not lost the context of what happened, which is the most important thing. Uh, the question is, uh, what about the policymakers, uh, those who sent the, the aircrafts to, to the area? Uh, and, uh, of course, we are back to this question. Can the civil societies uh, in the West uh, impact the policies of the government? Because if they cannot, there is no moral compass to the governments of the West when it concerns Palestine. Can I ask you something about, I mean, you were in, in the military yourself in Israel. You, yep. and you are an Israeli historian. Um, you, you've then studied, you know, um, military tactics, uh, military warfare. Uh, the, you know, you've called in 48, the ethnic lending on Palestine. I think people have to understand, I mean, what, what does the Israeli government and the Israeli army mean 
means when it says we are going to eradicate Hamas. Hamas is not a building, right? Hamas is not a car. Hamas is a political party, is hundreds of, of members. It's a military wing. What does er eradicating Hamas mean? I, I, I don't understand it. Yeah, I think that they, that they have an internal debate between two models. One model is the model of Beirut in 1982, when they forced the PLO headquarters uh, out of Lebanon, you know, eventually sieging Beirut and forcing Arafat and the whole leadership of the PLO to move to, to Tunis. I would call it, in bracket commas, uh, uh, the moderate uh, option, that they, they would hope to get such a military dominance that... Uh, the Hamas leadership would not be able to return to, to Gaza. I think the more extreme among them, whether these are generals or, or politicians, are thinking about massive killings of those they regard as Hamas militants. Uh, and um, such a, a destruction that uh, uh, the Hamas would have no presence whatsoever uh, in the Gaza Strip. I, I don't think this scenario will unfold, by the way. I don't think it's possible. Hamas is not only a movement, it's also an ideology. And and it's not just an ideology, it's part of the liberation ideology. Namely, uh, it will exist as long as the occupation and the colonization exist. So uh, you, you cannot by force uh, 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 uproot it. You can definitely inflict a terrible military uh, uh, defeat on it in Gaza, but you cannot uh, uh, eradicate Hamas, nor can you eradicate the Palestinian national movement. You can maybe temporarily uh, make it uh, disappear from, from Gaza or Gaza City, let's say. Um, but what then? What then? Uh, one, one should think about, and, and I think that the second model, I said the first model was Lebanon, 82. I think the second model is the Taliban in Afghanistan, uh, the American attack on Afghanistan in 2003. And that's a very important historical lesson. You know, America said, we will uproot and kill and eliminate the Taliban in, in Afghanistan. Well, we're in 2023. Uh, after hundreds of thousands of Afghan people died, the Taliban is in power. Um, and, and But, of course, leaders don't go through processes of learning, unfortunately, and don't see the, the, these connections, which are very clear. So I think what they have in mind is huge force, massive killing, massive expulsions, uh, the end result would be more worse, I'm afraid, worse than ethnic cleansing. It would be much more closer to our definition of genocide than ethnic cleansing, which is really worrying and frightening. And it's still there's still time to stop it. I mean, it's I know a lot of people were already killed, but we're not we're not at the magnitude of the disaster that can unfold. You know, so so it's very important for all of us, with all our means, to to try and persuade the world that uh, this is what's going to happen, you know, because before it's too, before it's too late. But I think that, that's what they have. They, they have in mind, as I say, minimal model of Beirut, maximum model of the, the way Afghanistan was, was attacked. Um, in both cases, I think they will fail politically, strategically, they won't fail militarily. I mean, Hamas cannot stop the Israeli army. It's uh, now almost uh, 360,000 soldiers that are going to go in. They, they will occupy Gaza. I mean, anybody who thinks that Hamas can stop Israel from occupying the Gaza Strip doesn't know what they're talking about. They won't be able to stop it. And, and they will find the tunnel city, so to speak, and they will destroy it. Unfortunately for the families, and I know some of them in Israel, I don't think they really care about those who were uh, taken to Gaza. I mean, they keep saying that they do, but I don't think this will be a consideration. Uh, I'm very, very sorry to, to say it. Uh, you know, uh, these are really innocent people who, who, who are, I'm not talking about the soldiers, I'm talking about the, the civilians. Um, uh, and this will not stop the Israelis, even if the Hamas, which I don't think they will, execute them publicly or something like that. As you say, there's so much uh, fake news about all of this. Um, 
uh, this is what they're going to do. The message is back home to the Israelis. We are, we are, here is the revenge. And the revenge has to be visible uh, and, and mighty. Uh, and and that's 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 not a military objective, but but this is what you hear from them, and and therefore I think that's the way we should approach it. I've got two last questions, two quick ones. I mean, not that quick, but um, do you think Hamas had a long long term end game with this operation? They must have been planning this for months or maybe years. They must have known that the response of Israel will be to try to eradicate Gaza or flatten Gaza. So do you think they've got, I mean, they've, they've got a lot of hostages, right? But you were saying that you think this time, and it, it showed, you know, a lot, a lot of them have already died because of the IDF bombardments, right? But uh, so do you think Hamas, that must have planned the next step, which was Israeli invasion of Gaza, at a long-term end game, and then what about the other region, regional players? You know, Hezbollah has been firing, it seems, a few missiles, but it's nothing major yet. Do you think Hezbollah, if Gaza is actually genocided, will remain silent? Well, well I, I don't know exactly the Hamas uh, strategy here. Uh, I guess that two things uh, were... Uh, behind the, the, this operation. One was the Gilad Shalit uh, deal, you know, uh, and they might still be right. I mean, that depends how powerful the families would be uh, uh, as a pressure group inside Israel. I mean, uh, as, as as the operation continues, uh, these families can, can, can be a factor, can be a factor. So maybe in my more optimistic moments, I, I kind of think that maybe there will be a political prisoners uh, exchange. Uh, I mean, exchange of polit Palestinian political prisoners with, with those who were taken. But I'm not totally optimistic about it. And yes, I think the other strategic uh, hope of the Hamas was uh, uh, that the Hezbollah and the West Bank uh, would, would join in into this and turn it into kind of a third uprising. With, with the support of Hezbollah in the north. It's very difficult to predict whether they are correct in it. Um, definitely any day into the military operation in the Strip puts a lot of pressure on Hezbollah to intensify its involvement. It's very clear from what they have done until now that they are very careful not to hit uh, uh, Israel itself in order to uh, start another Lebanon war. Uh, it's, it's, it's very cynical, but one should say that, that both sides so far are abiding by this game. If I hit only your army, I'm hitting only your army, you know, kind of uh, cynical game. Uh, but, um, but that might, that's very precarious. It can deteriorate. So yes, Hamas might be right, the problem with this, and I'm talking about from a military point of view, is that the Hezbollah lost the surprise element. Israel is very well prepared in the north. And I think that's one of the reasons Hezbollah is very limited so far in its uh, operation. Iran, I don't know how far they will go. Uh, I, I learned in the last 20 years that the Iranian uh, leaders are very good with words. Um, um, so, I don't know if it's a wrong gamble by the Hamas, because knowing the people in Gaza and people like in the Janine refugee camp, when you are with your back to the wall and you think you anyway you're going to be eliminated one way or another, you feel like you have it doesn't really matter, and it's much better to fight than to be idle and passive. And I think. That means that it's not really a strategy that has all the scenarios in mind, but it's one that you always hope. And this was true about, by the way, by the secular liberation movement of Palestine. You always hope that this kind of crying out uh, would wake up the world to interfere. Uh, so far, it hasn't worked. 
Uh, who knows? Who knows? And, and they will never stop trying because, uh, you know, the elimination of the Palestine and the Palestinians is an incremental process that goes on since uh, 1948. It hasn't ended. Uh, and, and they will try and they will not disappear and they will continue to resist. I have no doubt about that. Last question, Ilan. Does this moment change everything? It's a good question. I was thinking about it myself. I, I, I think the basic context of what we're witnessing in Palestine has not changed by the events. I mean, they're very dramatic, they're very worrying, and, and uh, one cannot underrate uh, the significance of what going, goes on. But the context has remained, and the context is that Israel is a settler colonial state that uh, deprives millions of Palestinians of their basic rights. The Palestinians are a colonized people who try uh, to liberate themselves and decolonize the country. Uh, this context has not changed after Saturday. It was, it was the right context to analyze, for anal analyzing the situation before, and it's the right context for analyzing the future. You you only hope that uh, at least one message sh should have been conveyed clearly to the Israelis, and and it may it may happen after after the revenge and everything that even if you have the strongest army in the Middle East, you cannot secure your population as long as you are an apartheid occupying colonizing state. This is a message which, of course, the Israelis are not digesting now. It's understandable. I don't expect them to digest them. But who knows? Who knows? Maybe in the longer term, uh, they could not avoid the analysis. However, they will explain to themselves what they call the surprise. They would say the army was failing, Netanyahu is responsible. By the way, this is, this is nonsense. Uh, Netanyahu, Netanyahu is responsible for many things. Uh, uh, the fact that the army was so easily uh, taken uh, was nothing to do with Netanyahu. It has to do with the fact that you cannot, by force, colonize and oppress millions of people. They will find a way to fight back, even if that would be a short-term uh, victory. And, 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 I, and in this respect, no, I don't think things have changed. And uh, the same danger of what's happening in Palestine to the rest of the Arab world, to the relationship inside Europe between communities, to the relation with the Muslim world. All this is still on the table. And Palestine is still an issue of injustice that has to be resolved, not just for the sake of the Palestinians, but for the sake of many, many other people in the world who see Palestine as a symbol of uh, injustice or struggle for, for justice. Thanks, Ilan. I think that's a very good way to end. Um, you know, we, we, you have and both of us have known how what Palestine means for the in a way the global justice movement. You know, Mandela said it himself. You know, uh, we won't be free until Palestinians uh, are free. So um, yeah, thanks, Ilan, and I hope you. Um, you. I hope you know your family is okay in uh, in Israel, and um, and we'll speak soon. Thanks, Ilan. In, inshallah. I hope so. Hey, okay, good to, good bye, to talk bye, to you. Man. Bye. Bye.